Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you William Powell and Olivia de Havilland in Suspicion. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Not long ago, a noted editor sat down to figure out what he called the basic elements of human interest. That is, the things that interest people most and motivate their thoughts and actions. Love, of course, was at the top of the list. And close after love came fear. And then, curiosity. Tonight in the Lux Radio Theater play, the RKO screen hit Suspicion, we have a mixture of these elements. Two people very much in love, whose lives are shadowed by a dark fear and bitter curiosity. And out of this combination comes what I think you'll agree is one of the most absorbing dramas of our time. And to do full justice to it, we have as our stars that able master of mystery, William Powell, and the ever-versatile and lovely Olivia de Havilland. In just a moment, we'll start to satisfy your curiosity. But first, don't forget that we want you to satisfy our curiosity on an important matter. Our 10th anniversary celebration, four weeks from today. We'd like you to help us select the play and stars you want to hear on that eventful date, October the 16th. Write your choice on a postcard, address it to me at Post Office Box 9, Hollywood 28, California. Your suggestions and your interest are what makes the Lux Radio Theater a truly national institution. Just as your purchases of Lux Toilet Soap help raise this curtain for you every Monday night. So you really get two prizes in one package, a fine product and fine entertainment. The clock is pointing now to curtain time. And here's the first act of Suspicion, starring William Powell as Johnny and Olivia de Havilland as Lena, with Charles Irwin as Beaky. Let me go. Let me go. Don't be a little fool. What's the matter with you? Let me go. On a hilltop overlooking the English countryside, the trees bend low before the moaning wind. Smoke gray clouds weave swiftly across a smoke gray sky. Against this sky are silhouetted the figures of a man and a woman. The man's arms are about her shoulders. She struggles wildly, frantically, then breaks away. Again, his arms reach out. Her hands are caught and held as in a vice. <laughs> now, what did you think I was trying to do, kill you? Nothing less than murder could justify such a violent self-defense. Look at you. Let me go. Oh, I'm just beginning to understand. You thought I was going to kiss you, didn't you? Weren't you? Of course not. I was merely reaching around you, trying to fix your hair. What's wrong with my hair? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. It would have been extremely discourteous for me to bring the subject up. Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. You, you always give me the feeling that you're laughing at me. No, I give you my word. What's wrong with my hair? Well, let me show you. Now, don't back away. I'm not going to hurt you. Let me see. Yes. This will do it. What are you thinking of? A week ago, I'd never even seen you. Oh. Now, here we are on a Sunday morning missing church while I unbraid your hair. I think you've done enough fooling with my hair. There. Yeah, got a mirror? You look splendid. I must be quite a novelty by contrast to the women you're photographed with. Hmm? In the newspapers. Oh. Well, how do you like your hair? Now, don't screw your face up like that. You look like a monkey. What does your family call you, monkey face? I'll have to go now. I, I shall be late for luncheon. Anyway, if my father saw me come home both late and beautiful, he might have a stroke. Are you sure Miss Lena isn't in her room, Burton? I knocked her just before I announced lunch. She said she was going to church. Oh, uh, what were you saying just before, my dear? About Lena. I do wish she'd get married, Stanley. I don't believe Lena will ever marry. She's not the marrying sort. Anyway, she's no need to worry. There'll be enough to take care of her. I suppose you're right. 
I'm afraid she is rather spinsterish. What's wrong with that? The old maid's a respectable institution. And Lena has intellect and a fine, solid character. Sorry I'm late. Oh, Lena, dear. Come and sit down. Oh, oh uh, Lena. What kept you so long at church, dear? I didn't go to church. I went for a walk. A walk? With a man. A man? Yes, his name's John, John Aysgarth. Tom Aysgarth's boy? How did you meet him? Pity he's turned out so wild. Rough luck on Tom. What do you mean? Well, uh, he was turned out of some club for cheating at cars, wasn't he? I don't know. I didn't ask him. Something unpleasant anyway. What's he doing down here? He's staying at Penn's Hayes. I shouldn't have thought Lord Midland would have had him there if he'd ever been turned out of a club for cheating. Well, perhaps it was a woman. He was correspondent or something, I believe. What ought to have been correspondent. Well, anyway, I'm going to see him again this afternoon. He's calling for me at three. Miss Lena, you're wanted on the telephone. Oh, Thank you, Burton. Tanley. She seems quite excited. Do you suppose... Hello? Oh, hello, Johnny. What? Oh, yes, a long time ago. When are you coming at... Oh, you can't. Oh, yes, of course I understand. Yes, please write. And thank you for calling. Goodbye. Miss McLeod Law. A telegram. Will you read it, please? I will see you, yes? Thursday, yes? At Beecham Hunt Ball. Signed, Johnny. Yes, I have it. Oh, Johnny. I believe this is our dance, isn't it? Hello, monkey face. Hello. Hello, monkey face. Hello, Johnny. <laughs> Come on, we're getting out of here. But we can't. Of course we can. This way, monkey face. Johnny, where are we going? Which is your car? This is ridiculous. It's over there. Good. Come on. Tell me, have you ever been kissed in a car before? Johnny. Johnny what? You mustn't joke with me. I'm no good at joking. I don't know how to flirt. Well, I'm not joking. I'm serious. Have you ever been kissed in a car? Never. Hmm. Would you like to be? Yes. Well, you're the first woman I've met who says yes when she means yes. What do the others say? Hang if I know anything but yes. But they kiss you. Well, usually. Have there been... Have there been what, monkey face? Have there been many... Well, I'm afraid so. Quite a few. Are you always frank with them like this? No. No, not particularly. Then why are you frank with me? Because I'm different? No, it isn't that. I'm honest because uh, with you, I think it's the best way to get results. Johnny, I hope I'm not saying the wrong thing. But I love you. No. You haven't said the wrong thing, monkey face. I think I'm falling in love with you, too. But I don't quite like it. That's why I stayed away from you for a week. I was afraid of you. I never thought it would happen like this. Neither did I. Dear mother and father, Johnny and I were married last night. Married? We're off for a month's honeymoon on the continent. Please forgive me. I love him very, very much. Just put those scripts there. Uh, the fun, darling. How do you like your new house? Oh, dark. Because if you don't like it, just blame it all on Mr. Bailey here. He rented the house while we were on our honeymoon. <laughs> yes, sir. He even decorated the place. But if you do like it... Oh, I adore it. I'm mad about it. Ah, well, in that case, you're talking to the right man. Because I engaged Mr. Bailey. Didn't I, Mr. Bailey? Quite right, Mrs. Aysgarth. Oh, Johnny, you're a genius. Uh, Mr. Aysgarth, I shall have to be getting along now. So, uh, what shall I do about the bill? Oh, uh, uh, uh just, uh, drop it on that pretty little table on your way out, old boy. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Aysgarth. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Oh, Johnny, I never dreamt I'd ever have such a gorgeous place. Are you sure you can afford it? Here, look. Uh, just press that button there on the phonograph. There we are. My dance, I believe. Oh, yes. 
Where are we? At the Hunt Ball. Where else? In Venice. And? And Naples and Capri and Nice. And? Paris. Paris. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes? Oh, oh, darling, this is, uh... Oh, uh, I've forgotten your name. Ethel, sir. Oh, yes. Well, Ethel? A telegram for you, sir. Oh, thank you, Ethel. What do you think of Ethel? Oh, she seems perfect. Hmm. Hmm. It isn't bad news, is it? Oh, no, no, it's from an old friend of mine. <laughs> Stupid fellow, he wants a thousand pounds. You couldn't spare a thousand, could you? A thousand? What does he want it for? Hanged if I know. Hmm. Probably because I borrowed it from him. You borrowed it? Why? Well, because I was going on a honeymoon with the loveliest girl in the world. I wanted her to be happy. Didn't you have any money of your own? No, not a shilling. But I thought... I had the impression... Johnny, are you... Are you broke? Monkey face, I've been broke all my life. Well, why didn't you tell me? And whatever made you take this extravagant house? Well, I didn't think you'd want to live in a shack. A girl like you who's going to come into plenty of money someday. Wait a minute. I can't quite get this into my head. Were you thinking of my inheritance when you... Oh, I don't know what to say. Oh, my darling, really. Isn't it silly to spend the best years of our lives waiting? Why not be comfortable now? Johnny, I'm just beginning to understand you. You're a baby. Oh, I know you didn't marry me for my money, but my income will never pay for all this. Never. Well, what about your father? Well, I couldn't possibly ask my father or even mother. You saw how restrained she was when she met us at the station. Anyway, you wouldn't actually want to live on your wife's allowance, would you? Oh, of course not, darling. Well, then. Well, I suppose if the worst comes to the worst, and there was no other way out of it, uh... Well, I suppose I'd have to... Uh, what? Uh, borrow some more. <laughs> I haven't touched old Middleham yet. <laughs> you ought to be good for a month or two's housekeeping. I think you must be mad. No, oh, now, darling, let's not... Johnny, uh... listen to me. Well? There's going to be no more borrowing. But what else is there to do? You've got to go to work. Work? Yes, work. You mean put on old clothes and uh, go out with a shovel? Don't be flippant. <laughs> well, what do you mean? <laughs> Oh, I'm afraid you're a bit of a dreamer, darling. You realize that in order to be a, a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician, uh, <laughs> darling, uh, you haven't been around. There are all sorts of jobs, Johnny. Well, I'm broad-minded. Let's have some tea and talk it over. We can make out a list of jobs. Might be fun. Oh, who's that? It's right there behind you, darling. Hello? Oh, hello, Mother. Oh, yes, yes, it's wonderful. A most beautiful house. Would you tell Father how badly I felt? Oh, he is. Oh, wait. Wait a minute till I tell Johnny. Johnny. Yeah? Father is sending us a wedding present. No. Mother told him how happy I looked and... Oh, I can't tell you how much this means to me. Me too. Yes, Father? Yes? Go on, ask him when he's sending it. It's coming right away by messenger. Well, uh, invite them over for dinner. And uh, if you can slip it in, just say that we were in the throes of job hunting when he telephoned. Oh, Johnny, really, you are the limit. What, Father? Yes, Johnny and I were just discussing that very subject, and he had several interesting ideas on the kind of job he'd like oh, to do. Oh, Mr. Edgar, there's a messenger from General McLeod, Lord. Oh, it's just come, Father. Hold on. Bring it in, Ethel. Yes, ma'am. I think I know what it is. Oh, Johnny, you'll be thrilled. In here, please. Oh, it is. Oh, how wonderful. Johnny, look. Uh, what, uh, what is the thing? It's a chair, darling, a Queen Anne chair. Oh, we had them in the family before I was born. Here's another one, ma'am. How many more, for heaven's sake? Just these two, sir. He sent us both of them. Oh, Johnny, these are our first heirlooms to be handed down to our children and then to their children. Well, that's the thing to do with them, all right. Oh, I must tell him. Oh, Father, you're so good to me that it makes me want to cry. Yes, you've made me very happy. Oh, and you've made Johnny very happy, too. Oh, yes. Wait a minute, Father. He wants to say something to you. No, I don't. Say something very nice. These chairs really belong in a museum. Go on. <clears throat> uh, uh, hello, General. Yes, yes, but uh, really, uh, uh, shouldn't you have sent them to a museum? <laughs> oh, well, naturally, we're thrilled. A job? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Lena and I were just going into that. Well, I, I have several excellent opportunities. 
I uh, just received a letter from my cousin, Captain Melbeck. He, uh, he wants someone to manage his estate for him. I thought I'd take the job. Well, I'm glad you approve. Yes, yes, we'll, uh, we'll get together soon. Goodbye, sir. That was a fib about Captain Melbeck, wasn't it? Was it? Listen to this letter. We'll give you an idea of the fullest consideration. Let me know if you would like to take the job. Yours sincerely, George Melbeck. Did you have this letter all the time? I did. Why didn't you tell me? Oh, because, dear, I never dreamed I'd be using it. Any more than I ever dreamed that we'd be receiving these two beautiful chairs. Oh, good afternoon, ma'am. Hello, Ethel. Mr. Aysgarth at home yet? No, ma'am. But there's a gentleman waiting for him in the drawing room. Oh, thank you, Ethel. Hello. I say, nice place old Johnny's got here. Oh, I'm Vicky Thwaite. You must be old Johnny's wife. Yes, I am. Didn't he ever tell you about me? Vicky? Oh, you're Vicky. I happened to be driving by. I thought I'd just pop in for a cup of tea. I've heard so much about you, Mr. Thwaite. Johnny told me about you, too. Ran into him at Newbury Races last week. The races? Oh, put my foot into it as usual, eh? Well, why, Miss says, didn't he tell you? But Johnny has a job. He couldn't have been at the races. Besides, he's given up betting. Oh, he has, has he? <laughs> but, but don't you believe it. Not Johnny. He's a great lad, he is. You mustn't mind Johnny cutting up. That's what makes him Johnny. Besides, he thinks you're a topper. Won't you sit down, Mr. Thwaite? I'm sure Johnny... Oh. Something wrong? Yes. There were two chairs here this morning before I left. Chairs? Disappeared, have they? Yes, apparently. Were they expensive? Yes. They were... They were museum pieces. Queen Anne. Oh, that Johnny, he'll be the death of me. Don't you understand? No, I don't. I bet you 20 to 1 old Johnny has sold them. Sold them? What for? For money, of course. Fellow's got to pay his racing debts, hasn't he? You know, these bookies don't trust a chap for long. Not a chap like Johnny, that is. I don't believe you. I don't believe a word you say. Oh, put my foot in it again, have I? My dear, you mustn't take it so seriously. After all, it's Johnny. Wonderful chap, Johnny. Well, he couldn't have sold them. He wouldn't without asking me. Are Mrs. Ace out of home, Ethel? Yes, sir. Here he comes now. Don't tell him a word I've said, but if you want to see Johnny at his very best, you just say something about chairs. Vicky. Johnny, how are you, Vicky? Well, fine. What are you doing here? I just popped in to see you, old boy. Good, good. Well, how's my little monkey face? Hmm? What's the matter, darling? Nothing. Why? You sure? Your wife seems to be missing some chairs, old boy. Uh, Vicky, your pipe's not lit. Let me give you a match. Thanks, old boy. About those chairs, old Dean. No? Huh? The missing chairs, old man. Oh, yes, yes, the chairs. <laughs> well, I suppose that American must have come for them this morning. What American? Oh, didn't I tell you, darling? Oh, stupid of me. Well, he dropped by about uh, a week ago. Friend of Melbeck's. Go on, old man. Well, anyway, he, he admired the chairs, offered a hundred apiece for them. Anybody would take that. I wouldn't. Oh, wouldn't you really, dear? Well, that never occurred to me. Why didn't you mention it? I'm sorry, darling. I thought I did. Oh, that's all right. But they're gone. They're gone. They're gone, all right. Shall we change for dinner? <laughs> ah, you're an angel. Hold on a minute. You say he offered you a hundred apiece for him? That's right. Let's have a look at the check. Oh, he'll send it along. I bet you ten pounds to a shilling you wouldn't dare let your wife pick up the telephone and ask old Melbeck, or, or, or whatever his name is, if he ever saw this American. Are you implying that my husband is a liar, Mr. Thwaite? <laughs> oh, now, monkey face. Don't mind, Vicky. He's only joking. Well, I prefer his jokes on other subjects. Are you staying for dinner, Mr. Thwaite? Dinner? I'm spending the weekend, unless you throw me out. Johnny's friends are always welcome. As long as they remain Johnny's friends. In a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars, William Powell and Olivia de Havilland, will be back with Act Two of Suspicion. And now, Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. Tell us, Libby, what's the latest? Hats, Mr. Kennedy, hats. Something new and quite different in hats. You mean the wind-blown hatless Vogue is out, Libby? <laughs> it will be when women try on these new styles. Tokes, they call them. With their close-fitting trimmings of flowers or feathers, well, they're so utterly feminine, no woman can resist them. 
And no man either, I might add. If that's a toque you're wearing right now, Libby, I, I believe you. <laughs> oh, I thank you, Mr. Kennedy. You know, styles are going to be very soft and feminine this year. Frills and frou-frou are the vogue. Irene Dawn, one of the loveliest and best-dressed stars in Hollywood, has one of these little toques. Seems to me, Libby, that kind of hat is bound to be a winner if it's combined with a soft, lovely complexion. A real luxe complexion. Mm, I should say so. In fact, this kind of hat is artful. It's actually designed to set off a nice complexion. Well, Libby, Hollywood stars like Irene Dunn know just how to keep their skin soft and smooth. With daily Lux Toilet Soap facials, they can be sure their precious complexions get gentle, cherishing care. Yes, those facials are quick and easy, but so effective. Lovely Lux complexions everywhere are proof of that, Libby. And I'd like to point out that recent tests of Lux Soap facials showed that actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time. So here's a Hollywood tip. For skin that's truly feminine, soft and appealing, why not use this gentle soap recommended by nine out of ten famous screen stars? You'll find it's a beauty care that really works. If ever your dealer happens to be out of stock due to wartime conditions, you'll surely have more soon. Remember, Lux Toilet Soap is worth waiting for. And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of Suspicion, starring William Powell as Johnny and Olivia de Havilland as Lena with Charles Irwin as Beaky. A week has passed, but in Lena's mind there is still a dim shadow of doubt, a faint indefinable fear, the dawning of suspicion. Now in the quiet main street of the town, she meets the local celebrity, a writer of mystery stories. Lena, dear. Oh, hello, Isabel. I've just been admiring your display in the bookshop. Murder on the footbridge. Yes, they're doing very well by it. How's Johnny? Oh, he's fine. He's an ardent admirer of yours. I don't believe there's one of your stories he hasn't read. Splendid. By the way, have you seen Talbrook's window? The antique shop, not lately. Well, my dear, they've got the most beautiful things. Two lovely old Queen Anne chairs. I'd give my soul to own them. Chairs? Lovely. Well, goodbye, dear. I'll see you for dinner soon. Yes, of course. I'll phone you, Lena. Back so soon? Vicky, I owe you an apology. Good. I mean, what for? I'll explain to you later. Oh, you seem to be rather hot under the collar. Must be about old Johnny. My dear, you mustn't be angry with Johnny. It's a waste of time. Now, if you want to get sore with me, that's different. I annoy everybody. Always did. Lena, Vicky, where are you? Hello, hello. I don't move, either of you. I must watch the expressions on your faces. So what have you got in those packages, old Bean? Vicky, this is a red letter day. Lena, look. Do you remember that little necklace you admired in Regent Street? Here. Well. And Beaky, here's a little present for you. What is it, old Ben? Oh, sick. Darling, do you remember this coat? Oh, I saw the hungry eye you gave it the last time we were up in London. It's yours. Well, what do you say? Johnny, I don't understand what made you do all this. Oh, no, dear, don't be angry. Johnny, I want to know what this is all about. Yes, what's it all about, old baby? Well, my friends, I have the pleasure of announcing that the Goodwood Cup has run today. And I happen to have backed the winner. A ten-to-one shot, ladies and gentlemen, and I had 200 pounds on him. 200 pounds at ten-to-one? Why, that's 2,000 quid. Darling, what's happened to your tongue? Ah, uh, I suppose you disapprove of my betting. Oh, come on, darling, smile. Johnny, where did you get the 200 pounds? Why, so, girl, that's not a very tactful question. Where did you get it? Oh, you know very well there was no American. I got it for the chairs, of course. You sold the chairs to gamble all your money on a horse. Well, not exactly. I owed the bookies some money. I got the 200 pounds to pay them off. But then along came this hot tip. Oh, darling, give us a smile. Now, oh, come on, old girl. Oh, I know. What? You tickle the chin and I'll make a noise like a duck. No, no good, Biggie. No good? No. Oh, I forgot something. Darling, look. Uh, this is a receipt from a certain antique shop. Paid in full for a certain pair of chairs. They'll deliver within the hour. Oh, Johnny. There, she's smiling. By Joe, so she is. Oh, Johnny, <laughs> darling. <laughs> well done, old bit. I say, what about celebrating? Uh, uh, trust Beaky to say the right thing at the right time. <laughs> look at me, darling. Happy? Yes. 
course she is. Here you are, Lena. This is yours, old girl. Thank you, Beaky. Here's yours, old bean. Ah. Now for a toast. So wait a minute, Beaky. What are you drinking, brandy? Oh, just as much, old bean. Oh, you know, that's not good for you. Oh, all right. Well, maybe just this once. Oh, thanks. Monkey face, I drink to the last bet that will ever be made by Johnny Aesgarth. The last bet, old bean. Bottoms up, eh? What's the matter with him? Sit down, Dickie, here. Johnny, get some water. Quick. No, it won't help. I've seen this happen before. There's nothing much you can do about it. Well, open his collar. He can't breathe. It's no use, darling. It'll either kill him or it'll go away by itself. Sorry, old man. One of these days, it'll kill him. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Aysgard. Good afternoon, is my husband in his office? Mr. Aysgarth? Why, no. When do you expect him? Well, I really couldn't say. Uh, perhaps you'd like to talk to Captain Melbank? Yes, I would. Very much, please. This way. Uh, Mrs. Aysgarth to see you, sir. Oh, come in. Mrs. Aysgarth, what a pleasure to see you. Good afternoon, Captain Melbank. Do sit down. Thank you. Captain Melbeck, I don't want to impose on you, but you're Johnny's cousin as well as his employer. I thought I'd come in and see you. Oh, of course. I've been feeling very badly about Johnny ever since I had to discharge him. Discharge? Now, don't worry, Mrs. Aysgarth. I told him I wouldn't prosecute. I don't understand. I told him I wouldn't prosecute. What on earth are you talking about? When did you discharge him? Six weeks ago. We had an unexpected audit. The accounts showed a deficit of 2,000 pounds. When I looked into Johnny's records, I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Aysgarth. He should have told you. Johnny, I am leaving you. It is very important that we never see each other again. Lena. Yes? Ethel told me she packed your grips. Yes. Then you've heard. Yes, I've heard. I'm so sorry, darling. Terribly sorry. This telegram just came from the doctor. Tells how it happened. Telegram? Deeply regret your father died early this morning from heart failure. Your mother wishes you to come at once. Oh. Oh. Nina. darling? A little. It's been a nasty week for you. I'll be glad to get you home. Nina, you ever have any regrets that you married me? Why do you ask that? Well, I was thinking of the will. It seems pretty obvious that your father would have left you a lot more than his portrait if you'd been anybody else but Mrs. John Aysgarth. Oh, is that what you meant? You haven't answered my question. What about you? Have you any regrets? Monkey face, marrying you is the one thing I've never changed my mind about. Do you really mean that, Johnny? Yes, I really mean that. I want nothing but to spend the rest of my life with you. And if you were to die first, I'd never... I would die first. Well, listen, what about you? I couldn't stop loving you if I tried. Have you tried? Yes. Once. When? When I found out you... Lost your job with Captain Melbeck. How long have you known? Since last Friday. Who told you? Captain Melbeck. I met him. Did he tell you why? No. Suppose you tell me why. Oh, well, uh, we just didn't get along. I say, it's quite nice here. Shall we uh, stop and look at the sea? <laughs> there you are. Quite a drop off this cliff, wouldn't it? Why didn't you get along with Captain Milbeck? Oh, I don't know. He's a bit of an old fogey, you know. Monkey face, I have always had the notion that the secret of success is to start at the top. The way to make money is to think in a big way. Look at all this land, for instance. Look at the view from these cliffs. Now, why isn't something done about it? <laughs> if I had 10,000 pounds or, or still better, 20,000, 
I could start a development here. All you need is 20,000 pounds. Uh-huh. For 30, next 10,000 wouldn't hurt a bit. 30,000 pounds. That's all I'd need. 30,000 pounds. Okay. You think you could swing it for that old bean? Of course. Now, now you see, Beaky? This is the ground plan. Wonderful, old bean. Then we could put the large hotel out there on the cliff, eh? That's the idea. Hello. What's going on in here? Monkey face. We're organizing a real estate company. We're about to buy a very beautiful piece of land right by the sea. What a view. What sun. What air. Then we sell part of it at profit. I see, but you, you'll need financing for all this. Of course. Well, have you found someone to put up the money? Of course. Who? Me. Oh, I see. Well, if, uh, the idea is mine, but the money is Beaky's. And uh, the corporation, well, uh, Beaky borrows against some securities he has in Paris. Now, uh, the company is going to be in my name. Yes. But... Look, darling, now, just let me show you how simple it is. Does Beaky understand it? Oh, perfectly. I think. I beg your pardon, Mr. Aysgar. Uh, yes, Ethel? You're wanted on the phone, sir. Oh, thank you, Ethel. Uh, excuse me, Beaky. All right, old man. Now, Beaky, please explain it to me, will you? Well, you see, my dear girl, well, you see, we, we buy up this land, and then we sell part of it. That gives us 100% profit. Then on the other part, we uh, build something or other. Oh, yes, but from whom do you buy the land? To whom do you sell it? Well, that shouldn't be difficult, do you think? Beaky, isn't it about time you grew up? I say, old girl, you're scolding. Yes, you need a scolding. Do I? Yes, you do. Shall I go and stand in the corner? Beaky, you're not being fair to Johnny. I say, old girl, that's a bit thick, you know. Why, he's the president of the whole valley thing, Jake. Gets a salary. Writes his own checks. Yes, that's what I mean. What's wrong about that? Yes, what is wrong about it? Well, Lena? I say, old Ben, Lena's telling me you're a bit soft in the head. Is that it? Well, it sounded like that to me. Uh, uh Beaky, hadn't you better be changing for dinner? Right, old Ben, I won't be a gift. What right had you to interfere in my affairs? But I wasn't really. I was only... You were only what? Well, I was only trying to tell Beaky that he shouldn't leave everything to you. It's, it's, it's not as if you were both experienced businessmen. What the devil do you know about business? Oh, very little. I only... Suppose Beaky had taken you seriously. You'd have ruined the whole scheme. Do you realize that? Yes, but if it weren't good... Well, that's my business, not yours. If I say it's good, it's good. But I don't want any interference from you or anyone else. Is that clear? Yes, that's clear. Yes, who is it? Yes, Johnny? I, uh... Well, I thought you might like to know. I'm calling off the real estate plan. Why? What happened? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps the land isn't any good. Or perhaps I don't like the idea of risking Beaky's money. Or perhaps it's a stiff job and I'm too lazy. I don't know what it is, but every time I play anagrams, I can only make three-letter words. D-O-U-B, D-O-U-B. No such word. Try this. D-O-U-B-T. Doubt. Thank you, old girl. Your turn. Here, Johnny, I don't see why you want to call off this real estate scheme. Uh, it's no good. The corporation's formed already. The money's been put up in your name, old boy. The deal's off, Beaky. Why do we have to drive all the way up there to look at it? Well, I won't be responsible for calling the scheme off without first proving to you it's no good. We're going up there early tomorrow morning. Take a look. Why are you so insistent? Because, as I told you, I won't be responsible. All right, old boy. What's the word you got there, Lena? M-U-L-D-E-R. No such word, is there? Try the R instead of the L. Murder. That's better. Murder. Johnny, I don't like going up there in the morning. Why do we have to go so early? Now, Beaky. Murder. Oh, well, we have to. Let's get on with the game. Your turn, old girl. The money in his name. Murder. The cliff's overlooking the sea. I say, Lena. The edge of the cliff. Stay away, Beaky. Lena, I say. He'll push you off. He'll kill you. Murder. Murder! Murder! Lena, what's the matter? Lena! Give me a hand here, Beaky. She's fainted. What time did Mr. Aysgarth leave? Why, about seven, ma'am. And Mr. Thwaite went with him? Yes, ma'am. Why didn't you wake me? Well, Mr. Aysgarth said not to disturb you. What car did they use? Well, ma'am, I don't... What car? Which one? Listen. Oh, that's Mr. Aysgarth now, ma'am. He's back. He's come back. Morning, Lena. Johnny. Feeling better? 
What's the matter? You're white as a sheet. Where? Where's Beaky? What? Hello, girl. Hi, Felix. Oh! Any better? Mimi, what is it? Oh, Johnny. Oh, darling, I'm so glad. Oh, well, what's all this? I've only been away a few hours. Oh, it seems like a thousand years. Yeah, it seems like that to me, too. Oh, shut up, Peaky. It was nothing. Nothing? I came vain to lose my life. You call it nothing? You n- nearly lost your life. Came very close to it. Let's drop the subject. No. Go on, Beaky. I want to hear about it. Well, there we were on top of a cliff. I was trying to turn my car near the edge. Was Johnny in the car? No, he was a few feet away. Go on. Well, I didn't realize I was backing the car toward the edge, but I was. And if old Johnny hadn't taken a flying leap and grabbed the brake, I should have been kingdom come by now. Johnny saved your life? Oh, Johnny, I can never tell you what this means to me. To you, darling? Yes, it means a good bit to me, too. You know, I think the old fellow deserves a reward. How about a night out? For celebrating on me, old bean. Oh, well, uh, that's very kind of you, Beaky, but uh, don't you have to go to Paris? Paris? Yes, yes, of course, so I do. My securities. I've, I've got to go over there and cancel the arrangements for them. Why don't you come over with me? <laughs> oh, right, the cad seems to forget that I'm a married man. Say, I tell you what I might do, Beaky. I might drive up, drive up as far as London with you. How about that, monkey face? Yes, monkey face. I mean, uh, Lena, you let him come. Well, it seems to me that... Yes, I know. A job. Well, it seems to me that I'll have much more chance of getting a job in London than I would around here. Yes, of course he would. Do let him, Lena. Well, I don't see very well how I can stop him. Good hey. girl. <laughs> Mrs. Vesga. Yes, Ethel? There's an Inspector Hodgson in the hall, ma'am. He wants to see Mr. Asga. Show him in, Ethel. Very good, ma'am. Will you come this way, please, sir? Thank you. Mrs. Aysgarth? Yes. My name's Hodgson, Inspector Hodgson from the county police. How do you do? I understand your husband's not in, ma'am. No, he's been up in London for two days. Well, perhaps you might be able to help us. Yes, of course. I believe you know a Mr. Thwaite. Yes, he's a close friend of my husband. Well, I don't know how to put it quite. Perhaps it would be easier if I showed you this in this afternoon's paper. Right here, ma'am. Englishman found dead. An Englishman met with a mysterious death in a house in Paris. He is believed to be a Mr. Gordon Cochran Thwaite of... Beaky. I'm sorry to have to do this, ma'am, but we're making inquiries for the Paris police. They found some papers on Mr. Thwaite's person which indicate he just formed a corporation with your husband. What? What did the French police think caused the death? Well, this is a copy of a telegram that we received from Paris. Thwait visited the place in the company of another Englishman. On arrival, Thwait ordered a bottle of brandy. Brandy? According to one of the waiters, Thwait's companion asked for the brandy to be served in large beakers. Apparently, as a result of a bet between the two men, Thwait filled one of these beakers to the brim and drank it all. The other man was not present when the actual tragedy happened. I'm sorry, ma'am, but do you or your husband happen to know of any friend of Mr. Thwaites who might have been there with him? No. Well, then perhaps you could enlighten us about this corporation. Yes, I believe I can. My husband had planned a real estate development with him. Mr. Thwaite had gone to Paris to dissolve the corporation. Thank you, ma'am. That's all. Good day. Good day. Hello? Hogarth Club? May I speak to Mr. Aysgarth, please? He left? Left when? Yesterday morning. No. No, it doesn't matter. Thank you. Station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In 
a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars William Powell and Olivia de Havilland will return in Act Three of Suspicion. And now, here's a very reasonable question from an American housewife. Now that it seems likely the war in Europe may soon come to an end, why should I keep on saving my used cooking fat? Why, Mrs. America? Because the need is still critical, perhaps more critical than ever. But will fats be needed as urgently to manufacture war materials and medicines to send abroad? After Germany's defeat, there's still Japan. Remember this, too. The Japs still have the fat. They hold the countries from which we used to import about one billion pounds of fats and oils each year. A billion pounds? That's a lot of fat. It is, indeed. Enough to help manufacture the supplies of ammunition, medicines, parachutes, and other war materials that must keep on going to our fighting men abroad. Remember, too, our domestic production of fats is short. It has had to fall off during the war. Well, I guess I'd better keep that salvage tin handy on the stove just as I've been doing. You're doing a necessary patriotic service when you continue to save every drop of used kitchen fats and turn them into your butcher. Every bit you throw away may deprive one of our men of some vital thing he needs. The war isn't over till our boys come home. We need to keep on doing everything we can to get them home sooner. Fats are essential materials of war. Don't waste them. Save them every day. Turn them into your butcher. Remember, he, he still gives you four cents a pound and two red ration points for every pound you turn in. That's the message your government sends you. Here's what Mr. Lee Marshall, Director of Distribution, War Food Administration, tells you. Saving used fats is not a glamorous task. It takes effort. But it is one that only you, the American housewife, can perform for the country. We ask you to continue the wonderful job you are doing to help speed final victory. And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. When the play is over, we hope you'll join us behind the scenes for an informal chat with our stars. Now here's Act Three of Suspicion, starring William Powell as Johnny and Olivia de Havilland as Lena. mind, the sharp sting of suspicion has given way to the dull, sickening ache of certainty. Certainty that her, her, her husband is a murderer. Returning to the house, he stands framed in the doorway, looking at her. She turns toward him with fear in her eyes. You've read about Beaky, have you? I was terribly fond of Beaky. Were you? Yes, I loved that silly, generous, good-hearted fool. Did you? Of course I did. Next to you, I loved him more than anybody in the world. Next to me? Oh, poor monkey face. Here I am thinking only of myself, forgetting about you. You liked him too, didn't you? I liked him very much. The police were here. Oh, what did they want? They wanted you to help them. They had a telegram from Paris. And it seems there was an Englishman who made a, a bet. Oh, yes, I know. The whole story was in the late edition. What else? The inspector wants you to phone him. He thought perhaps you could help identify this Englishman. What did you tell them? Uh, uh, did you mention the corporation? Naturally. I told him Vicky was planning to dissolve it. I wish you'd left all that to me. Hello? Uh, which the police station, please? What else did you tell them? That's about all. Hello? Uh, hello, Inspector. This is John Aesgar. Yes. Well, I drove up to London with him Tuesday evening. Yes, I, I saw him off at Croydon Airport. No, no, I uh, stayed in London until uh, this afternoon uh, at my club. Lena, how nice to see you. Sit down, dear. Isabel, you know, I couldn't put my light out until three this morning. I was so interested in your last book, I had to come over and talk to you about it. That's the nicest compliment I ever got. I was completely fascinated by the way your villain enticed his victim across the footbridge, knowing this bridge had been sawn through. And he also knew his victim couldn't swim. Don't forget that. Well, what I want to know is this. Would you call that an actual murder? Well, from a moral standpoint, there's no question at all. It is murder. I suppose it is. What does Johnny think? Johnny? Oh, I haven't discussed it with him. Well, I think he'd be interested. The same situation with this friend of his in Paris. The same? Well, that brandy business is just like my foot race. By the way, this brandy thing isn't new at all, you know. It's been done before. Oh, yes. And in real life, too. I have it here. A book called The Trial of Richard Palmer. Where is that book? The Trial of... Oh, 
I remember where it is. It's in your house. My house? Yes. Johnny borrowed it a week ago. Hello? Hello? May I speak to Mr. Aescott, please? He isn't in. This is Mrs. Aescott speaking. Oh, well, uh, this is the Garantor's Life Insurance Company. Yes? Would you tell Mr. Aescott that there's been a slight delay in replying to his inquiry? That we've written him fully and he should get our letter in the morning. Dear sir, replying to your inquiry regarding a loan of fire policy... We regret that such a loan cannot be granted. According to the terms of the policy, payment can only be made in the event of your wife's death. If you... Morning, dear. Any letters for me? What's the matter? Nothing. Darling, you're not shivering, are you? Oh, I have a bit of a chill. The cold and all this sunshine? Oh, my poor little shivering baby. How do you feel now? Better? Much. Good. What are we doing tonight? We're going to Isabel's to dine. Oh, what a bore. Well, let's get back to that new book of yours, Isabel. You mean to tell me that a fellow sits down at a piano, starts to strum, and in two seconds later, he's shot? Is that the idea? Yes. A certain note on the piano was wired to a revolver concealed in the wall. Oh, I don't care much for that, Isabel. You're slipping, old girl. What's wrong with it? Too complicated. You're going to kill somebody? Do it simply. How would you do it? Simply, Johnny? Oh, I don't know, dear. Just use the most obvious method. For instance? Well, poison. Just use the first one that came to my mind. Say, uh, arsenic. Arsenic can be traced in the body, of course. Uh, but it isn't always. No. This very minute, there are probably hundreds of murders walking about. Johnny, do you suppose those murderers are happy? Oh, I don't know. Why shouldn't they be? Well, anyway, Isabella, it seems to me that by now somebody would have discovered a poison that can't be traced. But there... What about it? Isn't there? An untraceable poison? No. There's no such thing. Oh, oh. Isabel, you are hiding something from me. Johnny, you're locking up. What about Ethel? Well, it's Ethel tonight off. She won't be back till morning. What about Cook? Have <laughs> you forgotten? Cook's away on a holiday. Oh. Darling, you're shivering again. You suppose you're catching cold? Yes, I... I think that's what it must be. Oh, well, we'll have to tuck you into bed. Get you nice and warm. Come on. No, Johnny, please. Please don't. What's the trouble? Johnny, I'm in a state tonight. I, I don't know why, but I'd like to be alone. Would you mind sleeping in your dressing room? <laughs> of course I'd mind. Please, Johnny, I... I haven't been sleeping very well lately. Oh, I understand. You used to sleep badly when I wasn't here. Now you... All right, that's the way you feel about it. Good night. darling. Yes, Bill. I came over this morning. We were quite worried about you, Lena. This morning? I... I've been asleep all day. The doctor gave you a pill, darling. That's all you needed. Rest. I'll run down and tell Ethel to fix supper. Right back. Oh, he's one in a million, that Johnny of yours. Isn't he? I warn you, if you leave me alone much longer with him, my career will soon be over. He flirted with you, I suppose. Flirted? <laughs> Worse than that. He's worming all my secrets out of me. Did you tell him anything today? Did I? Oh, now, honestly, have you ever been able to deny Johnny anything? It was about that poison, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And if he writes a story on that one before I do... Lena, Lena, imagine. A substance in daily use. Anyone can get it. And within a minute after taking, the victim's beautifully out of the way. And mind you, it's undetectable after death. Is whatever it is, Painful? Not in the least. In fact, I should think it would be a most pleasant death. (laughs) 
Lena. Yes. Are you awake? Yes. I brought you a sandwich and a glass of milk. You might drink the milk before you go to sleep. I'll just leave it here. Good night, darling. Why don't you let me help you pack? Well, there's no need to. I... What's the matter with you this morning? You're still annoyed with me, aren't you? No, Johnny, really. I, I still don't feel well, that's all. And a few days at your mother's will do more good than staying at home. Well, it's, it's not exactly that. Don't you understand? Mother telephoned me. <laughs> she got on that phone awfully early, it seems to me. Well, Mother gets up early. I, I happened to mention that I was a bit nervy, and, and before I knew it, I, I'd agreed to spend a few days with her. All right. I'll run down and get the car ready. Oh, no. Don't. Uh, I'll drive it myself. I prefer to drive you. You're going too fast, Johnny. Well, you want to get there, don't you? Did you... Did you have to go by this road? Why not? It's a short way, isn't it? <laughs> There's the hotel site. Another thing I failed at. me out of your room. You've been running away to your mother's. Now you shrink away from me so you hated me. You're my wife, Lena. But I thought... You almost killed us both back there. Because you had to pull away from me even when I was reaching over to save you from falling out of the car. Well, you don't have to put up with me anymore. Johnny, wait. Where are you going? First, I'm taking on to your mother's. And then what? Don't worry. I won't bother you again. Johnny, you mean you're going to... Johnny... Why were you asking Isabel about that poison? What were you planning to do with... Johnny? You were going to kill yourself. Oh, my darling. Yes, but I've changed my mind. I'm going back to see it through. Prison term Maybe. and... You mean Melbeck? That money you took? I can't pay it back. I made the last attempt to raise the money when I went away with Beaky. To Paris? I went to Liverpool. I tried to borrow your insurance. But it didn't work. You mean you were in Liverpool when Beaky... Then you didn't go to Paris. Of course not. Do you think I'd have let some idiot give poor old Beaky that brandy if I had? Oh, Johnny. If only I'd known. This is as much my fault as yours. I was only thinking of myself, not what you were going through. If I'd really been close to you, you could have confided in me. But you were ashamed to... Oh, if I'd only understood. Oh, Johnny, it'll be different now. We'll make it different. People don't change overnight, Lena. I'm no good. Let's turn back, Johnny. Let's go home and see it all through together. No, that won't work. It will work. I know it will. Johnny, please. You can't shut me out. Turn the car around and let's go home. Please, Johnny. I'll get in the car. Johnny... Where are we going? We're turning back. We're going home. It's more than a matter of suspicion that tonight's performance will be long remembered by millions of listeners to the Lux Radio Theater. And for that, we can thank our stars, William Powell and Olivia de Havilland. Thank you, Cecil. You gave us a great play when you picked Suspicion. Now, you ought to be an authority on mysteries, Bill. One of the best bits of news I've heard is that you're going to do another picture in the Thin Man series. But, Bill, for the Thin Man, haven't you been putting on a little weight? <laughs> Libby, how can you say that? Why, well, I'm scared of my own shadow. Yeah. You mean it looks as if a crowd were following you? 
What weight I have comes from my iron constitution. Every morning when I get up, I turn on those exercises over the radio. And do them? No, my wife does. <laughs> I watch her. Bill, I don't understand you. When I was your age, I used to think nothing of a ten-mile walk. I don't think much of it myself. <laughs> but look, if you, if you want to know, I'm on an A diet. An A diet? What's that? A steak, A baked potato, A piece of pie. <laughs> Sounds like army rations. <laughs> well, it goes to the front. <laughs> Well, in spite of all you say about me, I'll confess you're looking as lovely as ever, Livy. Yes, isn't she? And now that I've planted it for you, Cecil, you uh, wouldn't like to tell us one of the reasons, would you? Me? No, no. Oh, come on. Yeah. Plenty of fresh air, sunshine. And Lux toilet soap. I'll say it for you. But well, there's no need to be modest about it, C.B. I use Lux, Lux toilet soap faithfully, and it does wonders. Well, thank you, Olivia. And I, I think we'd better take back all we've said about Bill's figure, or he'll dial us off his radio next Monday night. <laughs> Not when he hears what's coming up, C.B. What do you have for next Monday, Cecil? A play I think you'll like, Bill. The RKO romantic comedy, Lucky Partners. And our stars will be Donna Michi and Lucille Ball with Jack Carson. It's the story of two young people falling in love who stake their future on a horse race. <laughs> when you gamble both love on, on horses, you're riding for plenty of excitement. But it sounds like another entertaining evening, C.B. We'll be listening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I have a suspicion we'll be back soon. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lucille Ball and Donna Michi in Lucky Partners with Jack Carson. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Next month, October 16th, the Lux Radio Theater celebrates its 10th anniversary on the air. We'd like you to share in this celebration by helping us select the play and stars you'd like most to hear. Send your suggestions on a postcard to C.B. DeMille, Post Office Box 9, Hollywood 28, California. Or use the ballot which your Lux Toilet Soap dealer will be glad to give you. Suspicion was presented through the courtesy of RKO, producers of Bride by Mistake. Olivia de Havilland will soon be seen in her latest Warner Brothers picture, Devotion. William Powell appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture, Kismet. Heard in tonight's play were Charles Irwin as Beaky, Lois Corbett, Vernon Steele, Gloria Gordon, Charles Seal, Dwayne Thompson, Eric Snowden, and Claire Verdera. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And now, an announcement aimed straight at the fun-loving hearts of America's people. Your beloved old friends, Amos and Andy, are returning to the air on Friday night. Yes, the boys are back again with their big cast in their grand half-hour show. Their guest for Friday evening, John Charles Thomas, famous Metropolitan Opera star, will be a riot in his Amos and Andy role. There will be super music, and as you know, each broadcast is a complete episode. So, see your paper for time and station. And don't miss Amos and Andy on this Friday. This is your announcer, John N. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Lucky Partners with Donna Michi, Lucille Ball, and Jack Carson. Fry, S-P-R-Y. Better, better cook with fry, because you'll be a better, better cook with fry. Cakes, pies, fried foods. Everything tastes better, made with new Easy Mix Fry Shortening. So for light, fluffy cakes, tender, flaky pastry, crisp, digestible fried foods... Better, 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 better cook with fry. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.